for your volunteering and your coming forward with contributions. I hope you can put together a programme that makes some kind of sense, even though, as you'll see, it's very, very <laughs> Okay, I just want to say a bit about this temporal tradition, which has been going on for some years now, not every year, um, but for quite a while. And the point of it is to offer this community um, an opportunity to commemorate those killed in war or wounded in war, civilians or soldiers. Um, and not necessarily to do this through the normal uh, mechanisms that we have for doing this. So the traditional mechanism is the traditional benevolent service which happens in church and which doubtless happened in yesterday. But it's to offer an opportunity for um, an international community to express all sorts of positions about war, which would not necessarily be those that fitted with the traditional remembrance service. And it's been going for some time now as a gender war tradition. It's one which I'm very proud of and I think is going really very well. Um, and I think we'll hear a number of different perspectives on war, some of them will be those of the heroic patriotic kind, others will be much more um, protesting. And it's a great, I think it's a great opportunity to allow that kind of diversity. I would like to just say a warm welcome to three people in particular. Um, first is Neil Corcoran, who has written many, many books on many, many subjects and knows a great deal about this particular neck of woods and knows a great deal about um, shared healing and all sorts of uh, things to do with uh, 20th century poetry and contemporary poetry and, um, and also Bob Dylan and he will be giving us a short talk later on Dylan. The second person is Jenny Lewis who read me this year and is now um, teaching and is a poet and is teaching um, at um, the Department of Continuing Education and is a great deal of she's she's come back here to read from her forthcoming collection. And the third is Neil Nuttall, who is Jenny Nuttall's dad. Um, and I've introduced him as a headmaster on the programme. He is, he is responsible, I guess, for Jenny's love of poetry. And for that, we're all profoundly grateful. Um, so we're going to begin with the choir singing um, a very beautiful setting of Binion's poem. The person who set this was an undergraduate of this, Richard Holdsworth. And thank you very much. Can I hand it? <laughs>
much for suggesting that I should take part tonight, and particularly to bring a reading from the Bible, which I'm very pleased to do. The Bible actually has a very strong and uh, frequent note of remembrance. Uh, we are to remember the Lord in all our ways. We are to remember his love and faithfulness to us. We are to remember his mighty acts of salvation, especially, of course, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which we do every time we celebrate communion together. But we're also to remember the faith and the courage of the people of God over the centuries. Their example is meant to be an encouragement to us to live faithful Christian lives in our generation. And so Hebrews chapter 11 is a classic example of this roll call of remembrance, a list of the heroes of faith, which ends in an exaltation, exaltation that we should follow in their steps. Selected verses, Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received divine approval. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he received approval as righteous, God bearing witness by accepting his gifts. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, took heed and constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By faith Abraham <coughs> obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was to go. By faith Sarah received power to conceive, even when she was past the age. <coughs> By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave direction concerning his burial. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse for the sake of Christ, greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, for he looked forward to the reward. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, received promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and scourging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. <laughs> I'm reading 
tonight from um, an ancient French text, uh, the Song of Roland, which was written down in around the 12th century, but the French is actually much older. It's probably around the 9th century. So I'm just going to give a few lines of the ancient French to give a taste of the original. And then there's three verses in English. Ami rentre, je m'en irai en France. Comme je serai à l'une, à ma chambre, de plus à vrai, vendront les hommes étrangers. Demanderont, où est-ce les coins catènes Je leur dirai qu'elle est morte en Espagne. À grande douleur, tendre puisse en royaume. Jamais n'y a de que ne pleure ni n'en peigne. Dear Roland, I return again to Lou, to my own domain, where men will come from many a land and seek Count Roland at my hand. A bitter tale must I unfold. In Spanish earth he lieth cold. A joyless realm henceforth I hold, and weep with daily tears untold. Dear Roland, beautiful and brave, all men of me will tidings crave when I return to La Chapelle. Oh, what a tale is mine to tell, that lo, my glorious nephew lies. Now will the Saxon foeman rise, Bulgar and Hun in arms will come, Apulia's power, the might of Rome, Palamitan and Afric bands, and men from fierce and distant lands. To sorrow, sorrow must succeed. My host to battle, who shall lead when the mighty captain is overthrown? Ah, France deserted now and lone, come death, before such grief I bear. Once more his beard and hoary hair began he with his hands to tear, a hundred thousand painted there. Dear Roland, and was this thy fate? May paradise thy soul await. Who slew thee wrought fair France's bay? I cannot live, so deep my pain. For me my kindred lie undone, and would the holy Mary's son, ere I at Kisra's gorge alight, my soul may take its parting flight. My spirit would with theirs abide, my body rest their dust beside. With sobs his hoary beard the emperor tore. Alas, said names for the emperor. I've chosen a piece of Middle English. It's the Chaucer's description of the Temple of Mars. For the next temple in the Canterbury Tales. Although it's the, a description of paintings of the temple which celebrate Mars, I think in its imagery and its language it really gets across the horror of violence in all its forms. We shall be not as well eck tell you all the portraiture that was upon the wall within the temple of Mitty Mars the Leder. Our painted was the wall in length and greater link to the estrus of the grisly place that hit the great temple of Mars in face. In the ilka called Frosty Vigil, there as Mars hath his sovereign mansion. First on the wall was painted a forest in which there dwelleth neither man near best, with naughty nary ban and tree as older, of stubborn sharp and hideous to beholder in which there ran a rumble and a swoo as though a storm should breast in every roof. And downward from an hill under a bend there stood the temple of Mars army portenta, rocked all of burned steel, of which the entry was long and straight and ghastly, Porter said. And there came a rage and such a rage that it made all the gas of Fortaleza. The northern lift in at the door is shone, for window on the wall now was there known, through which men mixed and any lick discerned. The door was of Adam and Titana, it clenched over thwart and end longer, with ear and tough, and for to make it strong every pillar, the temple to sustain, was ton great of ear and drift and shame. There saw he first the dark imagining of felony and alva compassing, the cruel ear red as any glider, the pig purse, and egg the pale reader, the smiler with the knife under the cloaker, the shepner burning with the blacker smoker, the trazon of the mortaring in the bed, the open war with wounders or bed leather, 
content with bloody knife and sharp manisa. All full of chirking was that sorry passer. The slayer of himself yet saw he there. His hair to blood hath faded all his hair. The nail it driven in the shoda nicta, the colder death with mouth gaping at Richter. And midders of the temple sat mischance with discomfort and sorry continence. Yet sorry woodness laughing in his rage. Ahmed complaint, Utis and fierce rage. The Karen in the busk with throat corba, a thousand slain and not a qualmis dorba. The tyrant with the prey before sit after, the tune destroyed, there was nothing left. Yet sorry blant the ship is hoppy stairs, the hunt strangled with the wilder bearers, the soul fret in the chill, ricked in the cradle, the cook is scalded for all his long ladle. Nought was forgotten by the infortune of Martha, the carterer overridden with his carter, under the wheel full low he lay a doing. There were also of Martha's division the barber and the butcher, and the smith that forges sharper sword is on his teeth. And all above, depainted in a tour, sore eat conquest, sitting in great honour, with the sharper sword over his head hanging by a subtle between his head. Depainted was the slaughter of Julius, of great Nero and of Antonius, albeit that the ilk at home they were unborn, yet was their death depainted there before him be menacing of Mars, which be figure. So was it showed in that portraiture, as is depainted in the stairs above, who shall be slain, or else dead for love. So ye is un example in stories alda, ye may not reckon him all the way volta. The statue of Mars upon a carpenter stood, armed, and looked grim as he were wood, and over his head there sheen in two figures of stars, that being clever in scripture is that un puella, that other rubeos. This god of armors was arrayed thus. A wolf there stood before him at his face, with a in red, and of a man he ate. With subtle pencil was the painter's story, in reducing of Mars and of his glory. Fast forward many centuries now um, to two poems written a couple of centuries ago. Right? The first at the beginning of the 18th century and the second in the 1930s. The first by Anne Finch, Countess of Winchelsea, is an excerpt from a longer poem called All is Vanity. And here in this wonderful anthology, 101 Poems Against War, is called The Soldier's Death. The two poems are united in their anti-heroic take on war and also in their deployment of elegiac and heroic tropes and motifs. There's one word you may not be familiar with from the soldiers there, and that is hoboy, which means over. The soldiers there. Trail all your pikes, dispirit every drum. March in a slow procession from afar. Be silent, ye dejected men of war. Be still, the oboys, and the flute be done. Display no more in vain the lofty banner. For see, where on the bier before ye lies, the pale, the fallen, the untimely sacrifice to your mistaken shrine, to your false idol, honour. The second movement of war forward to the 1930s is by Doris Parker. It's called Simply Penelope, I won't say anything more. Except this. But the last line is hellishly difficult to deliver because I think it could be delivered for different forms of emphasis. And if you can listen to it and think, as I read, about the different emphasis that you might give it, we could perhaps talk about that in the later part of the evening, the more um, the improvisation part of the evening. 
in the pathway of the sun, in the footsteps of the breeze, where the world and the sky are one, he shall ride the silver seas. He shall cut the glittering rain. I shall sit at home as a rock, rise to heed the neighbour's knock, brew my tea, snip my thread, bleach the linen for my bed. They will call him brave. Um, it was immediately seized upon by lots of English composers, Paul Williams particularly famous in. But the Butterworth settings, I think, are extremely poignant, very, very beautiful, not quite so well known. <coughs> particularly poignant because he died at the Somme in, in 1968, the age of 31. And this is the last song in one of the, one of the collections. There's a tradition in Wales of competitive reciting, which means you don't always finish what you start. Um, and these are two poems by Ivor Gurney. 
Um, first one we'll quickly deal with echoes the comradeship of soldiers in the Great War. Um, Gurney was an established poet and a, a great musician before he went to war. Um, came back and in many ways echoed what happened to John Clare. Uh, there was a disturbance of the mind from which he never recovered. So this is Crickley Hill. The Orchis, trefoil, harebells, nod all day, high above Gloucester and the Seven Plain. Few come there, where the cool ever and again cries faintly. No traveller makes stay, since steep the road is, and the villages hidden by hedges. Wonderful in May. At Weir au Bois, a soldier wandering the lanes at evening talked to me of gardens, summer blessed, of early spring and tiny orchards, of the uncounted gold strewn in green meadows clay-cut shadows, black on the dust, and grey stone, mellow and old. But these were things I knew and carelessly heard, while in thought I went with friends along roads white in the sun, and wandered far to see the scented hay come homeward in warm loads. Hardly I heeded him, while coloured dim evening brought stars and lights in small abodes. Then, on a sudden, Crickly, he said. How I started at that old darling name of home, turned and fell into a torrent of words warm-hearted, till clear above the stars of summer burned. We shared memories and old raptures from each other learned. Oh, sun and steep! Oh, hill towering above! Chasm from the road falling suddenly away! Oh, tears. Sweet pride in you. Feeling the soft dew, walking in thought, another Roman way. You hills of home, woodlands, white roads and inns that star and line our darling land, still keep memory of us. For when first day begins, we think of you, and dream in first sleep of you and yours. Trees, bare rock, flowers, daring the blast on Crickley's distant. So that was Crickly Hill. And the next one is a much more personal poem. It's, it, it talks of what's inside you. Really. I was talking with Dr. Nuttall on the way here and saying that there is the voice of the poet within the poem. And then those of you that have done your writing will know that there is the voice of the writing, which is very separate to the voice of the poet. And then laid over that is the voice of the person saying the poem. If only this fear would leave me, I could dream of Crickley Hill and a hundred 
thousand thoughts of home would visit my mind in sleep. But here, the peace is shattered all day by the devil's will, and the guns bark night long to spoil the velvet silence deep. Oh, to think we once drank in quiet inns and cool and salt brown oxen trooping the dry sands to slake their thirst at the water flowing, or plunged in a silver pool to shake the sleepy drowse off before well awake. We are stale here. We are covered, body, soul, and mind with mire of the trenches, close clinging and foul. We have left our old inheritance, our paradise behind, and clarity is lost to us, and cleanliness of soul. Oh, blow here, you dusk airs, and breasts of half-light, and comfort despairs of your darling that long night and day for the sound of your bells, or a sight of your tree-bordered lanes, land of blossom and song. Autumn will be here soon, but the road of coloured leaves is not for us. The up and down highway, where go earth's pilgrims, to wonder where Malvern upheaves that blue emerald splendour under great clouds of snow. Someday, we'll fill in trenches, level the land, and turn once more joyful faces unto the country, where trees bear thickly for good drink, where strong sunsets burn huge bonfires of glory. Oh, God, send us peace. Hard it is for men of moors and fens to endure exile and hardship or the Northland's grey drear. But we, of the rich plains, of sweet airs and pure, oh, death would take so much from us. How should we not fear? The first of them is Does It Matter by Siegfried Sassoon, and the second is The Falling Leaves by Margaret Postel Cole. Um, the first poem in particular is one I remember resonating with me as a child, and although it was written during the Great War, um, it is painfully relevant now as well. Does it matter? Does it matter losing your legs? For people will always be kind. And you need not show you in mind when the others come in after hunting to gobble their muffins and eggs. Does it matter? Losing your sight. There's such splendid work for the blind. And people will always be kind as you sit on the terrace, remembering and turning your face to the light. Do they matter? Those dreams from the pit. You can drink and forget and be glad and people won't say that you're mad for they'll know you fought for your country and no one will worry a bit falling leaves today as i rode by i saw the brown leaves dropping from their tree in a still afternoon when no wind whirled them whistling to the sky but thickly, silently, they fell like snowflakes, wiping out the moon. 
and wandered slowly thence, for thinking of a gallant multitude, which now all withering lay, slain by no wind of age or pestilence, but in their beauty strewed, like snowflakes falling on the Flemish clay. I'll be reading and uh, now to be still and rest by a PhD. Now to be still and rest while the heart remembers all that it learned and loved in the days long past. To stoop and warm our hands at the fallen embers, glad to have come to the long way's end at last. Now to awake and feel no regret at waking, knowing the shadowy days are white again. To draw our curtains and watch the slow dawn breaking, silver and grey on English field and lane. Now to fulfil our dreams in woods and meadows, treading the well-loved paths, to pause and cry. So, even so, I remember it, seeing the shadows weave on the distant hills their tapestry. Now to rejoice in children and join their laughter, Tuning our hearts once more to the fairy strain. To hear our names on voices we love and after. Turn with a smile to sleep and our dreams again. Then, with a newborn strength, the sweet rest over. Gladly to follow the great white road once more. To work with a song on our lips and the heart of a lover. Building a city of peace on the waste of war. Gestures, which in our case 
we have not got. This is the safety catch, which is always released with an easy flick of the thumb. And please do not let me see anyone using his finger. And you can do it quite easily if you have any strength in your thumb. The blossoms are fragile and motionless, never letting anyone see any of them use their finger. And this, you can see, is the bolt. The purpose of this is to open the breech, as you can see. We can slide it rapidly backwards and forwards. We call this easing the spring. And rapidly backwards and forwards, the early bees are assaulting and fumbling flowers. They call it easing the spring. They call it easy in the spring. It is perfectly easy if you have any strength in your thumb. Like the bolt and the breech and the cocking piece and the point of balance, which in our case we have not got, and the almond blossom, silent. In all of the gardens and the bees going backwards and forwards. For today, we have name of palm. The poem you've just heard was uh, the favourite poem of Lucy's father. Uh, Lucy's father did not know his own father. He was killed on the Somme in 1916. Uh, Lucy's father, as a young man in the 1930s, joined the Territorial Army. And that meant in 1939 he was sent to France. He took part in the disastrous Battle of France in 1940 and was one of the last soldiers evacuated from the beach on Dunkirk. My grandfather lost a leg at Passchendaele in 1917. And my own father came to Oxford as an undergraduate in Michaelmas term, 1938. He joined the Navy in 1940 and he spent the rest of the war escorting convoys and merchant ships. I think he was very lucky. He told me he never actually saw any death and destruction at first hand, although he did pass through many of the notorious locations we <coughs> had seen. In the excerpt and in a read, uh, the sailors were not so lucky. Their escort, little escort ship has just been torpedoed in the middle of the Atlantic, in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the night, on its own. There are two life rafts for 90 men. It reminded Lockhart of the way a party ashore gradually thinned out and died away as time and pain <coughs> and stupor and sleepiness took their toll. At one stage, it had been almost a manageable affair. Two rafts with their load and a dozen men each in their cluster of hangers-on had paddled towards each other across the oily, heaving sea. And he had taken some kind of rough roll call and found that there were over 30 men still alive. But that had been a lot earlier on when the party was a comparative success. As the long, endless night progressed, men slipped out of life without warning, shivering and freezing to death almost between sentences. The strict account of dead and living got out of hand, lost its authority and became meaningless. Indeed, the score was hardly worth the keeping, unless the night ended and the sun came up to warn them. On the rafts, in the whispering misery of the night that would not end, men were either voices or silences. And if there were silences for too many minutes, it meant they need no longer be counted. And their places might be taken by others who still had a margin of life and warmth in their bodies. All the men had longed for daylight. 
Ericsson merely noted that it was now at hand, and that the poor remnants of his crew might yet survive. When the first grey light from the eastward began to creep across the water, he roused himself and his men and set them to paddling towards the other raft, which had drifted a full mile away. No one said anything until the raft met and touched. And then they all looked at each other in horror and in fear. The two rafts were much alike. On each of them was the same handful of filthy, oil-soaked men who still sat upright, while other men they stood in their arms, or sprawled like dogs at their feet. Round them in the water were the same attendant figures, a horrifying fringe of bodily corpses, with their meaningless faces blank to the sky, and their hands frozen to the rat lines. Between the dead and the living was no sharp dividing line. The men upright on the raft seemed to blur with the dead men they nursed and with the derelict men in the water as part of the same vague and pitiful design. Um, Martin reminded us in his introduction there, uh, of course, of the way we should remember the survivors as well as those who died during our wars. My own father was also in the Navy and had the ill luck to be in Singapore Harbour when the Japanese bombed it, which meant he spent three years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. There are more, the war, nobody survives the war. And the war is very proximate for me as his son. I remember him today. I'll say something about the genesis of uh, this Bob Dylan song, uh, first of all, and then play it, and then say a little bit more about it. It appeared on Bob Dylan's third album, The Times They Were Changing, in 1964, 1964, the middle of the Cold War, and it's, uh, it's very much a song written to that moment. Dylan takes his melody from the, surprisingly enough, from the Irish Republican song, uh, The Patriot Game, which was written by Dominic Behan, the playwright, Brendan Behan's brother. Uh, the tune of that song is almost certainly uh, an old Irish folk tune. But Dylan, in the way he had, immediately copyrighted the song. Liam Clancy, who recorded it, uh, referred much later on to, very sardonically, to little Bobby Dylan's instant copyright machine. Uh, the Patriot Game presents itself as a monologue spoken by an IRA recruit while he lies dying during the border campaign in the 1950s. The song opens as he identifies himself. He says, Oh, my name is O'Hanlon. I've just turned 16. My country is Monaghan, where I was weaned. Dylan, one of Dylan's great talents is that he steals magnificently. So he steals the opening lines of this um, Irish Republican song and turns it into this. Dylan has consistently rejected the term protest song for his work. Most protest songs need to be uncomplicated because they're programmed to get a communal response. They have to offer a sense of serviceable solidarity in order to produce some form of political action. So there almost has to be an element in such songs of preaching to the converted. And I don't think Bob Dylan has ever really been very interested in that. In fact, his career can be read as a form of serially distressing the converted, as he's refused to live up or down to various audiences' expe expectations of him over the years. Dylan might well think that the proper righteousness of protest songs can too easily corrupt into self-righteousness, <coughs> the kind of righteousness you congratulate yourself on. With God on our side isn't like that. It's not a song without blemish. The apparent conflation of Germans and of Nazis is, of course, unjust. And the line about the Holocaust in the ovens they fried is multiply problematic, it seems to me, not least because ovens aren't used for frying, so that the callow opportunism of the rhyme forces its attention on us. The greater ethical blemish of that line, because the rhyme indicates that he hasn't got his eye very closely on the appalling object he's purporting to give attention to, the 
ethical blemish of that line, I think, bears scrutiny in light of the fact that Dylan's grandparents emigrated to the United States as a consequence of anti-Semitic pogroms in Russia. And that's a whole other line of interest. <coughs> Nevertheless, I think we can consider this song a blast against self-righteousness. Implicit in its, reflect, in its refrain is the singer's righteous judgment of those who throughout the course of American history have been self-righteous enough to claim that they have God's committed support. Support, as the song proceeds, for chauvinism, genocide, colonial war, civil war, two world wars, the Holocaust, the Cold War, nuclear war. Dylan's irony is not complex, it's true, but it is damning. The song changes perspective completely in its penultimate verse in a way that would be self-undermining if with God on our side were actually a protest song. When Dylan unpredictably raises Judas's betrayal of Christ and addresses his audience for the first time, it's not to establish solidarity. Quite the reverse, it serves to bring the very possibility of communal judgment into doubt. I can't think for you you will have to decide. Dylan is here rejecting the role of guru, a role that many people in 1963 and 64 wanted him, expected him to play. Instead, he's advocating the necessity of individual thinking in opposition to a possibly <coughs> meretricious communal emotion. And what we're invited to decide is not a political, but a metaphysical question whether the man who had betrayed Christ was acting according to God's will. The idea is humanly obnoxious, of course, but, and I tread warily here, given some members of the audience tonight, it seems to me the theology is sound enough, since without Judas's betrayal, Jesus would not have been executed, and the Christian redemption could not have occurred. So, did Judas have God on his side? A great deal of Dylan's work absorbs material from the Bible. His knowledge of it goes very deep. So I think we're entitled to regard this question, which seems so unpredictable, as in fact the song's very ground. With God on our side may be predicated, that's to say, on Dylan's knowledge of St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Which could easily have been the song's epigraph. To raise the question of whether Judas Iscariot had God on his side brings the singer, he tells us, into a state of confusion. This is caused, I assume, by the almost vertiginous thought implicit in the song that if Judas Iscariot really does have God on his side, then human beings can hardly be blamed for claiming to have God's support too when they're engaged in comparable forms of treachery and murder. It's to be expected of them. Many years after 1963, to claim that we have God on our side when we go to war is, of course, what human beings, what we continue to do. The song does end, though, with the register of a kind of community, a community in extremity. The refrains of with God on our side, it's not really a refrain in any strict sense, because it varies throughout. So the ref what I'm calling the refrain, as it recurs, during the song, close in fact with the phrases its side, their side, your side, my side, his side. The our side of the song's title leads us to expect that that might well be the refrain. The phrase our side figures only as the song ends and with the most disabused scepticism, which it seems to me touchingly almost risks pathos. If God's on our side, you'll stop the next war. This makes the possessive adjective our as comprehensively inclusive as it may be, as inclusive as the human race itself. And it reverses the inclination of the refrain, because if God's not on our side now, nuclear weapons will mean the end of us as a species. And as the song makes clear, there just aren't any words for that. Thanks. Uh, 
first fellow, except that he fought in the desert campaign in North Africa in the Second World War. So he had some experience of sand. So this is sand by Alain Anderson. I am sand. No, I will not let you go. Let the wind come, let the dry wind's calls blow, and I arise, blinding your eyes, a smothering cloud. Try to lift your feet from my drift. I enfold you. Stay with me, stay. I will not let you go away. Feel my soft fingers hold you, soft as a bride, reluctant that her man should leave her side, holds him, gently restraining. Stay, and remaining, be one with me in the cold, white glare of the desert moonlight. See, your feet slip. They cannot grip. Why try? Lie down with me and die. And I will dry you, bleach your bones bare, white and dry. In a few months, Arabs will stare at your skull among the stones and your lovely white bones. But by then, my work will be done. Helped by wind, drought, and sun, we too shall be one. Stay with me. Stay. No, you shall not ever get away. Now about the author of the second poem, I know too much, so I won't delay. It's called the Orphan the, uh, Two Poems. First poem, a child, a village, and two severed heads. They burned the village, topped the parents, and left the child for dead. Couples came, childless and romantic, intent on some good action. With her facial scars, the missing arm and eye, she lacked attraction. Second poem. A child, a village, and two severed heads. They burned the village, topped the parents, and left the child for dead. Couples came, childless and romantic, intent on some good action. With her facial scars, the missing arm and eye, she lacked attraction. Then two came, looked her over, and put her on their list. Were they mad? Or heroic? Or had they seen some charm the others missed? Or did they think that with every feature hateful, given just any kindness, she'd feel bound to be broken? Um, please excuse me if I depart a little bit from uh, what is on your programme. I had a brainwave this afternoon and I thought better uh, of what I had chosen before. Um, the three poems I'm going to uh, read to you are written by three different poets, and each of them has a personal connection. And they both all touch issues of, of death, all touch um, issues of remembrance. Um, the first poem has an interesting connection with me. When I was a child, we lived opposite a man called Harry Sullivan. And when Harry Sullivan was a young boy, uh, he was sick one Sunday and did not go to church with his parents. He was lying in bed and he heard this whirring sound outside. He got up out of bed, stuck his head out the window and saw an airplane. It was 1919, it was the west of Ireland. He discovered later that the two pilots of the plane were Alcock and Brown, who uh, crash landed into a bog at Erislan. I heard the poem, Eris Lannan, uh, read by the poet himself, Tony Curtis. And he spoke about the fact that Alcock and Brown had been in the Great War. And his, the the one of the theses behind the poem is the fact that having looked death in the eye so many times, 
as First World War pilots, that they had very little fear left in them. And even doing things like, let's say, going out onto the wings to chip off the ice was not so bad as it had been going through the First World War. Aristotle by Tony Curtis. The way I heard it, they boarded a kite attached to a garden shed, attached to two Rolls Royce engines, and then hurled themselves like Newfoundland geese into the wind. And once they were up, not having a bird's sense, they had to fly their crate to the mouth of St. John's Harbour to be sure they were heading east. But I'd say that was nothing to men who had just come out of the Great War, four years flying over no man's land. Surely the bright side was that no one was firing at them. I'd say they just held on to the wings and sang. Isn't that what the British do? An Irish poet would often take a, have a, an easy chance of a hook at the British. The, the second poem is uh, called um, Because the World Can Do That to You by Sarah Broom. Now, it's not on your program. Please excuse me for that. Um, last May, I think it was about last May, I visited a good friend of mine in her home. It was a Friday, I remember. And she told me that her good friend, Sarah Broom, a young woman, a new, young New Zealand poet, who had been a DPhil student in the mid-90s here at Oxford, had just died, just died the day before, after battling of cancer for five years. And the whole evening was dominated, really, by my friend's sense of loss at the death of her friend. And then walking back home, back to St. Giles, where I live, I passed the Oxfam bookshop, and as I normally do, I stopped outside and looked at what was on the window. And before leaving her house, my friend had given me a photocopy of the poem I'm going to read to you. And to my astonishment, there was the collection of poetry that I have in my hand by Sarah Broom on the window. Indeed, I bought it the next day, a signed copy. The poem is written uh, to her three children, She's facing death. She's fear for them. She has tremendous regret at not being able to um, live, to see their adulthood, let's say, their, 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 their future years. Um, and I suppose all of us can think of our own mothers, and we can think of that deep bond. Because the world can do that to you, by Sarah Brew. And if the world did do that to you, and took me from you before the time was true and right, and before we had all the time to see the things and do the things and tell the things we need to tell, to see, to do. So many things, I cannot imagine them. Because you are only six, and your mind is crowded with soccer and cricket and deep-sea life with knights and narnia and the thermaline conveyor, and when you were five, you cried inconsolably for 45 minutes when the All Blacks lost. And already, when you read, you cannot hear my voice. And you are fierce and deep, and I am afraid for you. And because you are only two and three quarters, and your heart is full of trains and racing cars and tigers and tiggers and dinosaurs, and when you jump into the pool with your water wings on, your face explodes with surprise and joy every single time. And you are tough and resilient and cheeky as hell, but you still need to know where I am about every three minutes. And because you are only nearly one, and your mind is full of God knows what, sticky things, shiny things, soft things, loud things, faces and brothers and chuckles and screams and every time you lie drinking your bottle by yourself I think of all the times I wasn't there of how they rushed you into life like there wasn't enough time in the world which there isn't sometimes so if the world did do that to you and took me from you before the time was true and right and before we had all the time to do the things we need to do to fight more and laugh more and be bored together over and over 
to ease into the big question slowly, not all at once, not like that. Like a trapdoor opening up under your feet and a sickening drop. But if the world did do that to you, I would have to think that you would be all right after all. The third poem, uh, final poem, is The Fallen Oak by Giovanni Pascoli, an Italian poet of the last half of the 19th century, the first decade or so of the 20th century. His father was assassinated and his family fortunes dwindled after that. Um, the translation is by Seamus Heaney, who died um, a few months ago. And um, I, one of the towns I grew up in, in, in the west of Ireland, is a place called Clifton. And there was this terrific arts festival there. For a very small town, it's really quite exceptional. A town of about 1,500 people. And every year they produce an anthology like this. And um, she was here, he sent some poems for this anthology. People like Bernard O'Donoghue who sent poems to it. Derek Mann, many others too. Helen Bendler, for example, sent a short story to them. Um, but I suppose this poem is published nowhere else, I don't know, um, apart from this um, relatively obscure anthology from a small town uh, arts festival, admittedly a rather exceptional one. The Fallen Oak by Giovanni Pascoli. <coughs> Where once its shadow spread, the oak tree lies in state. In battle with the hurricanes as lost, People say, now I see the size of it. Here and there inside its fallen crest, the small string nests hang on in tattered bits. People say, now I see the good of it. Everyone's happy. Everyone's chopping at it. Everyone goes home with his bundle of sticks. Next thing a cry in the air, a black cat flits, searching for something she will not find, her nest. My father fought in the First World War in Mesopotamia, Iraq. He was wounded at Kut al Amara while supervising a work party in bright moonlight. Thirty-five years later, he met and married my mother. Uh, I was born and he died when I was two months old. Uh, I spent most of my life searching for and this led to research into his involvement in World War I as a young second lieutenant in the South Wales borderers. The two poems I'm going to read come directly from that research. The first, Baptism, is from accounts in the war diaries of the South Wales borderers at the National Archives, the battles in early April 1916 of Falayaha and Sanayat. The second, Mother, reflects my anguish as a mother of two sons and as a woman of the powerlessness that women feel in the face of war. And I read this poem, Mother, sometimes in the voice of an Arabic mother and sometimes in the voice of a British mother. And I think you'll see, I'm going to read it tonight in the voice of an Arabic mother, and I think you'll see why when I read the poem. But first, I'd like to read a very short description, extract. The 7th and 8th of April, the assault on Samayat. It was bitterly cold. The men were only wearing khaki drill, no greatcoats. They were wet through and frozen. They woke numb and stiff with cold. They were also grievously hungry, as rations had been held up. It was night, dark. The only light was from flares and rifle fire. There was din and mayhem. Many of the troops lost any sense of direction. They couldn't hear commands. As dawn broke, Turkish fire became more deadly. British and Indian troops retreated 400 yards. 
50% of the South Wales Borderers Battalion had been killed or wounded, including, including Captain Austin, Captain Coulson, Captain Farrow, Lieutenant Morgan Jones, Lieutenant Macaulay, Lieutenant Caldwell, Second Lieutenant Usher, and Second Lieutenant Jones, TLR. And the estimated losses were 1,200 among the battalion, and the others, other losses, were other ranks who aren't named in the diaries. Baptism. They could have been made from stone, the same stone of country houses spurting valerian from walled gardens. They were freezing, hopeless, cold as slate, when marsh water flowed into the trenches, carrying cholera, and they went over the top in darkness to meet darkness, lit by enemy flares, stumbling and drowning with the bolting mules, too numb to know what they were doing or which way they were supposed to go. Back home, the font was wreathed with laurel. It stood sunlit under an angel, leading a child away from harm. Mother. Childbirth was like being excavated. My belly rose on whalebone wings. Pain soared about me like a blooded angel. Then you were born. I saw you with my own eyes. I held you day and night. You lay in my arms, a glowing pupa. At Kut Alamara, you were backlit. The moon pointed you out against the ridge. When British gunners stopped your spade, you fell slowly, shedding iridescence. Each night in dreams, I failed to catch you. Your bones, the fragile quills of rescued fledglings you placed by the stove for warmth. This is very much a work in progress. I'm sorry, but we'll have to operate. A grave face and a graver voice. The tumour's too advanced for us to treat in any other way. And I believe the sorrow and accept the need. No, the doctor really has no choice. She didn't plant the tumour in my fertile flesh. She didn't feed it or prevaricate while knowing that it grew. The slicing of the scalpel's bad, but better than the deadly growth nature of my body that were God. It is with great regret and after much debate, the politician's solemn face and earnest voice, that we've concluded that we have no option but to launch a full-scale military strike. And given how things stand, it's hard to argue that there is a better, less destructive choice. If they don't act, ten times the deaths, a hundred times the suffering will ensue. It's their own corrupt and bungling ways that brought them here, that trapped them in this spot. Anyway, Prince, war would not be as the surgeon's knife. We'd not be forced to cut to stop a greater rot if honest, brave, clear-sighted leaders ruled, which in our case, we have not got.
because that was standing from the middle. Um, I think it does remind us of the need for a community purpose and function for poetry and music. And just as a kind of upbeat ending, um, I'd just like to announce that next year, to commemorate um, the First World War, the centenary of the First World War, there will be a whole day long of events centred on commemorating um, the people who lost their lives in, those, in that uh, conflict that was in many other countries. Jeremy Paxton will come and begin the day for us. We will have uh, poets, we will have panels, we will have uh, poetry from the community, we will have music, we will have everything from all day long, just as we have had this evening.